Hello, everyone. My name is Matthias Campo. I'm an associate professor of architecture at Taubman College, uh, director of the Architecture and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at the University of Michigan and partner at SPAN. Um, I'm the creative director of the section on AI and architecture of the Italian Pavilion of the Venice Architecture Biennale 2021. So we are here today to kick off our exhibition with a roundtable conversation of the participating architects and teams, Daniel Bolohan of the FIU and Non-Standard Studio, Daniel Köller of UT Austin, Emmanuel Ko, uh, Singapore University of Technology and Design, Sandra Manninger uh, of the Ariel Lab and SPAN, and Kyle Steinfeld uh, from UC Berkeley. To kick off the conversation, I have a couple of remarks about the field uh, of interrogation of today's discussion. Architecture design is a very volatile process. It is hard to break down into discrete chunks. Attempts to do so very often fail, but just oversimplify the intricate neurological processes involved in a design process. It is almost impossible to judge architecture design on a purely pragmatic level. They always simultaneously discuss aspects that include planning processes, economic environments, material preferences, political conditions, stylistic fashions, aesthetics, and the general culture of the time the design was created. Whether this be in the rigorous structure and geometrical purity of a Renaissance building or in the intricate voluptuous and at times, as Mario Carpio put it, messy geometry of the architecture of big data, in both cases, it is not surprising that the intrinsic matter of designing involves aspects of ideology. Both examples mentioned above can be identified as representative of ideologies that span areas beyond shape and geometry and involve political, social, and economic conditions. It might not surprise that to that extent, they, are, they represent a vessel and repository of the history of architectural imaginations, and as such can be considered an enormous mine for new ideas on the nature of architecture. What is meant by this? Traditionally, prospective architects are trained during their studies to operate like data miners. Every new project is based on the hundreds and thousands of images ingested during the training they received in architecture school. This, of course, is an oversimplification of a highly complex pedag pedagogical model, but at the very core, there is an element of truth to it. Learning the trait of designing architecture is a profoundly visual matter, amplified in the age of social distancing with Instagram, Pinterest, TikTok, Zoom, and mirror boards. This image-based tradition can be exploited with an, a series of techniques deriving from AI research, such as style transfer, cycle gun, style gun, et cetera, et cetera. Neural architecture interrogates the emerging field of architecture and artificial intelligence through work increasingly entangled in questions of agency, culture, and ethics in AI research. This rapidly developing field of architectural inquiry is ripe for rigorous interrogation. Almost daily, new practices emerge that focus on opportunities that an expanded human mind through AI offer for architecture. Neural architecture oscillates between those poles of tension, informing the public audience on the discipline about the status quo and the vision of this paradigm changing new ecology of design. The first genuinely 21st century design methodology. The group of architects pres present in the AI section of the virtual pavilion interrogate the emerging field of architecture and artificial intelligence through work that is increasingly entangled in questions of agency, culture, and ethics in AI research. This rapidly developing field of architectural inquiry is ripe for rigorous interrogation. Almost daily, new practices emerge. At the same time, AI is observed with suspicion in regards to potentially displacing entire practices out of the field. So neural architecture oscillates between those poles of tension. And today we will discuss several of those uh, aspects. And I'm curious to hear from our participants, their thoughts, their design agenda, and possibilities to apply certain ideas from AI to architecture design. I have a larger question, which is um, how, like this is a general question, how does architecture benefit from AI? What's the benefit of using AI in architecture? First, very easy with optimization. It means it can take over a lot of things which I don't want to to take on. Like this was Sandra earlier mentioned. Right? Like, like for example, like emergency path routes, uh, fire protection, or like all like as architect, you have such a huge amount of overload of regulations or like safety issues, and everything comes in. So of course, like an AI which can 
is highly optimized in a way to, to, to recognize or like, like to fulfill a certain, certain purpose. Can uh, of course always take this for my shoulders as a as a designer or architect, and I can then, for example, have time uh, for for dealing with ethical questions and so on. So, in that form of augmentation, as a in a way, an additional form of mutation, the same as the, the pen paper or like a section and plan was was one form of augmenting uh, architectural thought. So so also AI at some point uh, much more in a simple way, much more productive. Uh, it will be uh, in first like yeah the taking on or like uh, I, I think they will have a have an impact and also heavily lifts uh, in a way I think uh, uh, making an environment more richer or like like design uh, more richer because actually it can be more complex uh, in, in the first place. So. From a from a kind of design tools perspective, my answer would be about how, how does architecture benefit from AI. Um, when applied to something like a design tool, AI might, um, it promises to combine the power of a computational tool with the tacitness of something like natural media, um, the kind of flatness of something like natural media. And I think that that would bring a, um, that would resolve a, an existing um, lack in things that we've uh, done with computational tools and design for the past 40, 50 years? I think for me, what AI can do for architecture or how architecture will benefit from this new technology or paradigm is not so much about the, you know, people talk about automation or optimization, but really for me is about this a different way of uh, seeing, right? A different way of being nudged to design uh, in a perhaps if you term it non-human way of thinking. In that sense, a non-human way of conceiving possible architecture spaces. And that that is interesting because we can then move. I think Richard Hamming, uh, the mathematician mentioned about this idea of the blind spot, right? Where where we could not perceive certain frequency because like cats could you know, perceive it in a different frequency as human. So th there is this sudden opportunity to somehow reconceptualize the, what architecture space could be. And we also know that um, increasingly and very soon we'll be living with uh, robots and machines. So there is this other aspects, other kind of occupants as well. And, and in, in that sense, it's also timely. Right, the the using AI to think be, beyond the human uh, centric way of uh, design. That's a really interesting point. Um, I was thinking a while back. Um, this we, we might this is a, a a suggestion or a kind of thinking about extending previous paradigms, but um, we've lot, we've lived with generative design as a kind of you know domain for some time, and it's of course usually. Op it's a process of optimization that seeks to, you know, satisfy some number of usually quantitative constraints like material weight versus structural performance or something like that. Um, one potential, I think, uh, rich territory to explore is to integrate qualitative criteria that are evaluated based on data, like based on, you know, a machine learning thing that can classify based on style or taste or the perception of space, as you say, Emmanuel, from like a non-human perspective. Imagine combining that with like a generative design sort of workflow, and then you can, I, I think it opens up new, fresh possibilities in that space. I, I actually wrote this, sorry, it's just a one minute thing. I, the, the reason I talk about this uh, new perception of space is linked to my own, you know, doctoral studies where I, I basically list, listed three preconditions this idea of no figure, no ground, this idea of no parts, no whole, this idea of no shapes, no grammars, which, I mean, for the last one, those who are familiar with shape grammars, you know, it's basically rule-based. So the idea is there's no such things uh, about shapes, but rather this idea of textures, which is what really activating the, the or at least in the beginning layers of the neural networks. So yeah, Daniel. Yeah, so I agree. I agree with this kind of idea of perception. I, I think also um, I see this one as a very strong, in a way, um, 
benefit of using uh, neural networks because most of the time as, as uh, designers, as architects, we always operate with sort of filters, frames in a way, the way that we, uh, we perceive the world, the way we interpret it, the way we design, we always have these kind of filters. And for me, it's always interesting to, uh, to operate maybe with these kind of networks to challenge that kind of perce perception, to, uh, to force you in a way to start to think differently or something. Um, and that's, for example, one, one of the, one of the uh, experiments that we are running with Coupillon Blau. Uh, we have these kind of networks that we, we can blindside them, you know, you can blindside the network from uh, perspective of saying, okay, you're not going to see things now in elevation, you're just going to understand uh, perspective, or you're just going to understand elevation now, or you're not going to understand materials, you're going to understand all it is, and so on, yeah? So like this, in a way, uh, I think it's really helping, uh, and um, in the end, you might end up with, with solutions that you never considered, you know? Uh, maybe one For uh, me, addition. Uh, it's, it's probably... <laughs> Uh, uh, this not only restricted to AI actually, but it was always about uh, understanding uh, the construct automatic metrics of the environment through all the tools I've been using throughout the years and uh, giving the opportunity to have even more sensors, even more uh, capacity to be able to understand the spatial construct and try to figure out what you, what kind of situation you're really living in. I think that that is for me uh, the most interesting part and providing, uh, and for me, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm providing the body of architecture to manifest these so, new forms of, of potential possibilities and, and what it really is. Because obviously uh, through the uh, centuries and millennia, we have been developing and trying to learn and train ourselves the environment has changed because we understand it differently. You know, from, from the ceiling that was punctured, that was a surface that was punctured and light was coming, the celestial light was coming, shining through it to a flat surface, to a sphere. And now uh, probably just a two-dimensional uh, surface again, you know, probably they were not right, wrong in the Middle Ages, you know, with this punctured surface the light and data is constructing this 3D holographic environment that we're occupying. I think that's an amazing point. And probably here, just to put also this one there, uh, out there, like probably once we have all these kind of senses and we understand in a way uh, spatial qualities from multiple in a way parameters, uh, probably uh, we, we end up with the dimensionality problem where as humans, we cannot necessarily uh, understand anymore. Uh, things and probably also this is the problem with the machines like we uh, we have the machine outputting something and we don't consider that thing being novel or creative because we cannot understand it you know and when in fact maybe something's super creative and maybe also this kind of aspect of interpret interpretability of the networks it's a, a, an important topic that I think as architects will have to start to look at you know because the more we increase these kind of networks and the sensors of the networks the more complex the problem becomes and the harder it's for us to, to actually uh, judge results, yeah? And then if you have this kind of like uh, maybe secondary network that actually are able to give you a sort of interpretation or to explain somehow uh, what the network is doing and how it uh, arrives in certain result, that I think can help a lot and can push design actually forward. Because suddenly we are not bounded by this kind of human limitation where they're just able to perceive things from a certain uh, parameters or we are able to evaluate a few parameters at the same time yeah? and suddenly we can get all this information in and still have in a way a, a correct uh, selection let's say. I mean there's one thing about this Daniel which is, uh, is an observation that I always like your background image because I always can use it as an example <laughs> exactly of what you're saying. I mean the one thing that neural networks are really really good in and I think we can agree on that is feature recognition edge recognition all these kind of uh, aspects and for example your image in the background which is obviously based on images from Copimmerblau has still some features inherent there that are recognizable as Copimmerblau in some way like certain angles maybe the way the glass is is cut so I still can have there's enough familiarity for me there to interpret it as a possible building yeah. But once that defamiliarization goes too far, that's when that aspect comes into that you said that we cannot recognize it anymore as being a specific object. It 
becomes completely alien to us. And maybe the power of, of AI and of neural networks is the possibility to have just enough familiarity to still be recognizable as a building, but still enough alienation to be interesting for us as something new and different. Yeah, and thus maybe pushing us forward in terms of at least aesthetical uh, considerations. And I like the idea of this sort of post-human environment of, of design and a, a different way of uh, perceiving the world. I, I love, for example, all these LiDAR images that come out from automated cars and the way that they have this colorful vision of the world that is so different to ours, but it's totally pragmatically designed. Yeah. And especially this combination between pragmatism and new aesthetics that comes out of that, I think is very powerful in terms of informing a cultural discourse and, and many other things. Um, I wanted to, to point out something different, which goes also back to what Daniel uh, and Daniel's background, which is the ability of neural networks to capture individual sensibility. And that's a very interesting uh, possibility that you can train a neural network to inherently understand what your sensibility is, so to speak, and it can generate new models out of that. Yeah? And it's very interesting to me that companies like Copenhagen and also Morphosis are so invested in that research. Does it tell something about you know, their owners and their age maybe? Uh, you know, is this idea of immortalization? I don't know, maybe. Maybe not, maybe I'm reading too much into this. But on the other hand, also the ability not only to generate new things out of it, but the, the possibility to interrogate the entirety of the history of our discipline. And because all this, these machines need so much data, our discipline is perfectly uh, fitted to do that. I mean, we have, I actually tried to research that. We have about 9,000 years of plants on our disposal, yeah? That's probably more than any other discipline in the world has in, in terms of data, yeah? So uh, with these new possibilities, we're actually able to mine this enormous repository for hopefully, you know, it can be optimized solutions, it can be different solutions, it can be an advantage. I don't know yet, but I think that's also one of the things that I'm interested in being part of the architecture discipline and the, and the conversation, but we will see. I'll, maybe if I would um, be permitted, I'd open with a question um, for uh, for the other for the others in the panel, and I, it speaks to something that we um, that we talked about in the past and was a was a you know, potentially revealing of a point of disagreement, which I'm quite excited about um, among us, which. Uh, I was speaking, uh, the, the, I think the way that we framed um, this discussion in the past had to do with, um, I, I think, I, I believe I characterized a previous technology and set of um, methods in architectural design, the kind of era that has just passed as, um, as being kind of fundamentally about uh, first principles is the way that I put it. Um, and attempted to sort of contrast the way I, I approach or the way that I, I see machine learning techniques. Um, so maybe I, I think I'd like to kind of reframe that or, or talk about it in a different way. And so the way I'd like to enter into that, if I could, would be to ask the panel what people see as the affordances of machine learning and architectural design. And I'm borrowing that word affordances or affordance um, from interaction design. I've had an opportunity to kind of to, to, to work with people from UX and UI from that sort of world. And this is a sort of well-trodden concept there. But basically the, the, this, the idea is that um, an affordance is a property of an object which um, demonstrates or expresses, shows users the actions that they can take with that object. So it's not necessarily a limiting term. It's not to say that the affordances of a technique or a technology are the only things that one may do with that thing, but rather it's the, it's the interactions, the properties, the ways of working that are suggested or perhaps are encouraged. Um, so uh, the, 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 um, so the question would be uh, for everyone, what are, the, what are the unique of machine learning and design um, from your point of view? I mean, like, um, I may mean, have to jump in, like, affordance directly, uh, it sounds like a, like a proof of work. 
like uh, like a, I think it's very contemporary in a way. Uh, I would not limit it directly to uh, only the, the question of uh, intelligence, but uh, computability or like uh, a larger larger shift. Uh, when you see it, but uh, not like uh, referring to to in a way um, like cryptocurrencies, mining, and so on, which became especially like last year quite quite famous. But with that also a shift from, uh, in a way, how you deal with criticism or critique. When uh, before it was more in, uh, in, in kind of like postmodernism, I think was very much defined as, a, as an opposition to, to an opinion. And with that, uh, uh, criticism also uh, was always like, or uh, the last stage, I think, was something, as something which, is, which is strange which is weird or like something which I can't understand. And, and I think that this in, a, in a kind of how you deal with that, so something you say like affordance, I think is, is, a, is a positive kind of description of a, or, or like again, take on, on, a, on a problem or what you see as a problem or an opportunity. So, so I think you have, again, like uh, is, a, is, a, is a turn into, into a, uh, also a kind of positivism. So this is interesting generally on the whole kind of idea of or like a, any kind of kind of movement which you would associate generally of artificial intelligence. Just see, for example, um, uh, and, and just not not yet to come direct to architecture, like um, like a language translation, which was usually thought to be. Uh, like uh, to, to, to automate that or like to, to have really a language translator uh, was thought as an impossibility. So actually uh, people began to, to work on that or to break this down or like work on that in a, in a field of what you would today define as a field of machine learning, artificial intelligence and so on, began to rationalize that, made possible. And this is also fundamentally a different approach to something which is modernistic. And modernism, like think of Esperando uh, and, and such approaches, which try to generalize uh, topics or themes or something like a language to establish like a, a standard. And so, on. so, and what we, I think what we now can do, like is, a, is first is a, is a different, uh, a positivist uh, approach again, but also with a completely new, new kind of understanding how we begin to, to address opportunities, problems, or see, you know, like it goes on the quite question, like uh, what we consider as science or scientific as rational and so on. So that's, that's interesting for me also as a, as a designer that this, this kind of positivism in a way. And, and that you know, like is a potential for, for also for creativity then, because you have this positive turn and a different, uh, completely new addressing of, uh, of topics. Maybe I can add something to that conversation, Daniel. Thanks a lot for that. And, and maybe I'd like to continue the conversation about um, Kyle's question um, of, of, let's say, the continuation or, 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 the, or the question whether it's a continuation or a paradigmatic shift. I think that's one of the major questions here. And uh, I recently read, I cannot exactly say from where the quote is, but uh, that uh, Paradigms have the, uh, the, the habit to change when they have run its course, right? So, and uh, I, I currently have the feeling that a certain paradigm has run its course. And then because of that, there might be a paradigmatic shift. And uh, it's, it's very visible, I think, in, in that um, it is not only a style, what, what this whole AI work is about. It's not a purely visual, um, nature of things that make it recognizable as something new. It's also the, 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 uh, the size of it. Because like, for example, we, we know certain paradigmatic shifts in architecture that were pu purely stylistic, right? But at the moment, what is happening is that the tool sets that we're trying to apply in architecture are, are the same tools that are being used in completely different fields of interrogation. Yeah, whether it's economics or science or, uh, or car production or fabrication, art, music. So it's, it's really influencing 
not just a small set of the architecture field, it's absolutely a paradigmatic shift in a cultural um, understanding, like, like how we are producing cultural artifacts and how they are perceived also at the same time. So there is there's a larger or, um, over arching um, aspect of the design work that you see here in the exhibition, which is trying to understand as architects who are involved in cultural production, how these novel tool sets are applied to our own discipline and what they change within our own discipline. The, or the question is also, do they change the discipline? Because that would be another one, right? Um, so there's, there's this, whole, this whole aspect of understanding the larger, the larger implications as, as, a, as, as, as a cultural phenomenon, I would say. Yeah, talking about paradigm shift, I think that, that there are remnants of the previous paradigm. Well, at this moment, because what we're doing now is kind of new and emerging, of course, and also People are kind of doing it. Um, lots of students are really into this uh, particular discourse, as we can see from uh, recent conferences and lots of books, including mine. But going back to the issue of affordance, the way in which Don, well, Don Norman mentioned about affordance, which actually came from the, uh, the uh, psychological uh, uh, environmental ecology, is that the idea, the emphasis was really on the design object, uh, if I'm not wrong. But in, in the case of the tools that we're talking about in, in, uh, in deep learning, in, in AI, is that the, the, the tools actually has huge affordance in the sense because it is essentially a technology. It is some, it's not actually an object. And if we trace back to the history of, uh, in, in architecture, the avant-garde, right, maybe from the digital turn onwards, we architecture, as a discipline has this huge, well, kind of persistence or, or consistency in abusing the original affordance of tools, right? If you think about how Maya was abused uh, for our own purposes and subsequently it, or, or also processing in, in some sense, it, it forced into a three-dimensional world because architects were really into the three-dimensional aspect of it. And in fact, eventually it morphed into more specific uh, software tool sets uh, that is really much more suitable for architecture, like the visual programming in, in uh, CAD software, Rhino, or Grasso. So there is always this early stage of experimentation where we abuse the affordance and increase this affordance and eventually abandon its original environment or platform and move on somewhere else. So. I think at this moment we are kind of, we well, are not stealing from the the AI research work in terms of the the tool sets, the the uh, uh, models. I think eventually, or well, at least my my hope or naive uh, belief that we could also contribute back, uh, which is one of the uh, underlying motivation when I wrote uh, the book that I recently published in uh, 2020, late 2020. Uh, the book um, Artificial and Architecture, uh, Intelligence and Design. The idea is, it's really a primer for my student to see, can we not just be a consumer of these technology, but rather thinking more deeply how to contribute back. Uh, and we also have a very strong tradition of speculation. If you looked at speculative design, we've been one of the design domains that did lots of Unbuilt stuff, lots of them, and they somehow stay on in our kind of memory as very important precedent uh, for future um, experimentation. And eventually, some got built. Yeah. I mean, about that question, um, Emmanuel, I would actually like to bring in maybe Sandra Manninger, who has been working, for example, first of all, long time ago with the OFI laboratory in Vienna, who is a, one of the oldest labs on cybernetics and artificial intelligence, uh, founded in the late 60s, to the work with Justin Johnson, for example, at computer science in Michigan, uh, at computer science in Michigan, where exactly what you mentioned, that sort of giving back was discussed. So Sandra, please, maybe. Uh, well, uh, I would like to go uh, back to the question then. Uh, 
if it's a shift or a continuation, I, at the end of the, it will be both, you know, so we will continue to work as architects, but then we will add this and uh, it will be probably a huge uh, change in the, in, the, in the industry. That, that's also a political decision. It's nothing that is only contributed by, by architects. But I, I think what makes it so different to work with it is, is that you finally have the possibility to bring in so much more information, uh, so much more uh, know-how and knowledge from under, other disciplines and uh, uh, create a model with them together. I think, I think uh, finally you really can morph from a design aspect, you can start to morph anything into, the, into this new tool. From a construction aspect, uh, it's a whole different level of, of changes or assimilations that have to be, uh, need to take place. So I think it's really what, what are we talking about? If we're talking about the design issues, then it might be really a paradigm shift. And I also agree with that it's, it's too big to be just a style. No, so uh, we are we are really uh, starting to incorporate uh, uh, things that we have never integrated in our designs before economic reasoning or uh, specifically maintenance opportunity that get to go beyond uh, the building itself, but really can introduce a lot a lot of information that is all about the city or it can go down to the uh, the very granular way to the uh, to the specific, uh, specific, uh, I don't know, molecule <laughs> in in a uh, water molecule that tries to penetrate uh, the building uh, up to a specific governmental uh, discussion about building codes. So, uh, uh, and and that's something we are we were never prepared for for uh, during our education. I think that's something that we have to discuss among us for the future of, of education educating our students. Yeah, to resonate a bit also what Sandra is saying, I mean, I agree that it might be that uh, it's a continuation or maybe in some parts it's going to be something completely new. Uh, I think for me, uh, the, 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 the thing that really um, it's a game changer in a way uh, when working with these new technologies is we are, we are at the point where we are uh, switching from expert systems to learning systems. So until now, we were really much engaging with this kind of rule-based, uh, with uh, morphogenetic, morphodynamic in a way processes and so on, which are mostly just expert systems. And then now suddenly we have the, the option to actually work with a learning system. So it's not anymore like just rules that we, uh, we hard code in a way, but it's something, a system that actually learns by itself in a way and maybe helps us in a way. And personally, in, in my research, I'm looking mostly at this kind of aspect of uh, um, how to augment design potency in a way, uh, and also how to engage in a way with uh, these kind of technologies to really uh, augment uh, designers' abilities. And this is very much in line with also what uh, Gary Kasparov uh, was uh, actually researching after he lost to uh, Deep Blue. Uh, where he was looking in a way at these kind of different modes of interactions between machines and, uh, uh, and uh, humans. And he actually found that this kind of interaction between a, a weak hum human player, uh, a machine and a, a very good process is superior to uh, a very strong machine or to a um, strong player uh, with, uh, with a machine with a, a, a weak process, let's say. Huh? So I think for me, it's interesting in a way to, to also look at this kind of aspect of you have now a system that is learning or it's able to learn something and then it's able to interact with you in a certain way. Uh, I think that's going to be something like a completely game changer yeah? because we are not talking anymore about the old way of rule-based uh, design kind of thing. We, we have a completely different animal in a way in our hands right now. So from that perspective, I think it's going to be a, a big, uh, in a way, shift yeah, uh, when it comes to maybe also design, the way that we are designing or the, the results, the designs that we are going to generate are going to be completely, completely different. I, I think they are going to be more informed, which is great. I always look for more intelligence in design. Uh, so yeah, I think these are just a few points. It's maybe, maybe as you have an entry, what, what architecture can in a way begin to contribute. When you say like it's a, it's a learning system, 
of course, there's Turing's uh, famous quote of what, like a good computer is like a, a learning child in a way and uh, begins uh, in a way to, to button up to learn. But, but I think like architecture is, was never like that. Or when, when, when you think about architecture education, the first thing what you learn is actually not to do something properly or not or creativity or this kind of like design starts that, that you don't make a stack. You don't make, uh, you know, like you, you try to go to go beyond. So, so I think also that um, there's maybe we reach also the, the time that uh, this, this we, we can and we readdress what actually learning means or like not what's, uh, what is then, what is the bridge to research? Or creativity and, and so on. So and I think there's also uh, uh, a big, uh, in a way, like like knowledge in the first way. Uh, also, when you uh, go back to the volatility of a of a building itself, uh, what what starts in a way with uh, with, with architectural design as, as thinking. Yeah, I think we are already like getting challenged on that aspect of learning and. Uh, I mean, the, the current models of deep learning, actually, they are maybe uh, misrepresenting the way that humans learn. And probably also that's why we have also issues with bias uh, in data. And uh, because in the end, uh, that's not how we learn that a human is equal to the other human, just by the amount of uh, shared in a way percentage in a data set or something. Yeah? Um, so I think that, that's, a, that's a great aspect. And also probably when it comes to uh, architecture is like, how, how you uh, discriminate in a, in a way against like good examples versus bad examples yeah, of architecture, how you build up per, perhaps a sort of learning set for, for, for that kind of uh, system that you are operating with. And I think that's going to also, also like put a very strong spotlight on, on our understanding actually of how we create as architects and probably it's going to, to uh, clear out a lot of the myths that are, be, uh, are behind creativity in architecture. Uh, but I think it's a uh, welcome from my side. It's a welcome, in a way, exercise to to try to understand how those processes actually work. I mean, I have to add something to this, uh, like one or two things. Like one being that um, everything that we are currently using in terms of neural networks in artificial intelligence, which is based on theories on thinking, is exactly that. It's theories. So we don't exactly know how our thinking processes really work. We have a working theory of how they work, and we can translate that to mathematical formula that we can implement in, a, in an algorithm. We don't even know exactly, for example, how human learning actually really works. Yeah, so there is, but nonetheless, the thinking about those things is what helps us develop these algorithms anyway. So it's helpful either way. But the, the other thing which is interesting is the aspect of creativity. And, you know, Daniel and I and others, we had had this conversation several times already about whether neural networks or AI is really creative or not. And I don't think there's a consensus there. But it, one thing that I observed is that very often it's us humans interpreting a result that comes out of a neural network in a creative way. This doesn't mean the neural network is creative, but that the result inspires us to be creative. Yeah, and I think that's a very valuable um, tool. It's a very valuable thing to have. And because it's based on, in the majority of cases, on no, in all cases, on known data, it will, it will contain certain aspects that are familiar to us. That's why it makes it readable to us to be in architecture or a specific building or is it a car. So we, we recognize certain things in those results that allow us to interpret them as specific objects. And thus we can continue developing them as an architecture design. I think there's this tendency, like in the, in the early days, people, people were saying that the brain is like a computer, right? So now we, often people get into that situation also saying that, you know, the brain and creativity or thinking process is like the deep neural networks. And then until the next day or year, a new model appears and then they say, this is how the brain works. And in fact, recently there, there's this book called The A Thousand Brains Theory, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, but this is probably not the place to talk about it. So there are these many uh, appropriated way of thinking, um, uh, which I think often I also need to uh, inform my student not to fall into that, that trap, to, to, to kind of uh, pre-decide too soon. And going back to um, Matthias, uh, you mentioned about 
this, I see it's more like a visual prompt where we generate something and it prompt us to do something. So in that sense, it might be, I suppose, more useful to say, um, to talk about creativity from a more, um, not a holistic way, but rather specific task. This is from my own observation when I work with my, my student also within my research is where to place the, the agency of creativity within the design process. We're not saying that it's gonna create from end to end because this is naive. Uh, in, in architecture project design is, is way more complex. So, and then, so there were discussion about should it be in the beginning or should it be in the middle? So if it's in the beginning, then actually it's quite dangerous. Often people talk about exploration of design and, and concepts, but that, or at least at this point in time, yeah, the, these models are typically good at specific tasks where let's say we have deci decided on specific concepts uh, or at least being prompted by it and then make a decision and then have the machine to do specific combinatorial uh, exploration, then that becomes, uh, I think, more effective. Uh, so I, I think the discussion about creativity should, should be more um, broken down further, um, yeah. I agree. I mean, I remember there's this whole conversation about interpolation or extrapolation in terms of how to how to read or create results. And AI seems to be quite capable when it's about interpolation, but not that good in extrapolation. And then humans are very good in that. So I remember what's his name, uh, De uh, Demis Hasabis, the um, the director of DeepMind, was talking about the problem that humans are really good in extrapolation, but AI has not achieved it yet. Yeah. And that's the point where, where possibly real creativity can happen. But he also mentions, for example, the success of AlphaGo and the move 37, which, which like there seems to be quite a big agreement that that was a creative move. That, uh, that this, and it changed obviously also, and Emmanuel, correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard, for example, that it changed entirely the Go scene in Korea. Like people are starting to make AlphaGo moves. And they, because there were there were a lot of moves they didn't do because they were teached in their in their uh, time learning go that they should never do these sort of moves. And now they're doing it and calling it an alpha go move. And suddenly games are changing. Yeah. So the whole change, the whole game was changed through alpha go, which is kind of fun. But you see that this kind of chess dem demo kind of intelligence demonstration is right from the beginning, right? Chess and then go and then uh, whatnot. It's always a very specific space of uh, creativity. So is what we can't just. I mean, I'm actually quite, quite skeptical about this. Even when Daniel William uh, mentioned about uh, seeing the success in these AlphaGo stories, it's as if it could be applied in other uh, scenarios, other domains of creativity, full fledged or it. I think is a very, very different space. Maybe it makes sense if we, we have a clear design space. Um, so maybe the game analogy makes sense. I don't know. Well, I agree with you on, on that, that it's probably not possible to compare the game with th this couple of rules that it has, because it doesn't have that many rules, to the to the vast intric intricacies of and, and weird thing of designing, because designing is such a strange process in what how your mind is connecting things and ideas and things you read and images you saw. And it's a fuzzy cloud of things that suddenly emerge in a, in a project, right? And um, so... I think that's one of one of the aspects that probably is not yet really uh, possible to re replicate in in an artificial intelligence yet. I'm not saying it's not possible, but it will more take more time because it goes rather the direction of a generalized AI, which we all know is a really difficult thing to achieve, right? Versus a specialized AI that solves one problem after the other, which works really fairly well. So maybe architecture should focus rather on the idea of of uh, utilizing. Um, the specialized AI is um, in order to achieve specific problems or discuss specific aspects. I fully support that. I think that the, the, the questions about generalized AI and is the machine itself creative rather than an instrument which facilitates creativity, these are interesting, but ultimately I think will be left behind in the immediate moment, much the same way as um, you know, natural language processing has been left behind by the AI researchers as like a, a part of AI. This is what happens with AI. It spins off 
things that are then no longer considered a part of AI because they've kind of been solved and have become, and they sort of become these uh, their own domains, which are also interesting. It's just kind of more well-defined. AI is always a moving target. And I think that ultimately for us, what's important is I think what, like what's in front of us, this, you know, a neural net is very clearly not a creative being. <laughs> like, and all of us who have worked with it can see it very clearly. It's, it, it, it is not going to do something interesting on its own. It's going to be crafted, you know, by, by a human author or, or by, by a, a, a group of people, a culture of people into doing interesting things or, or treating, treating it in interesting ways. So I think it's, I think it's worth kind of leaving that, that part aside um, because I think there's tons of other interesting questions. Um, in particular, I, and this, actually I should say, this is actually one reason why I'm, I, 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 pref I like to frame things in terms of um, affordances is because it, it speaks to the kind of relation, the, the relationship of a kind of human author or set of authors, right? In some distributed way and a creative act, a creative work. I know that that's not the only way of looking at this, of course, but it takes questions of automation and general intelligence, you know, artificial intelligence out of the, out of the picture. Um, so I really like this framing of like moving from expert systems to learning systems, because I don't think that we really, I think there's a lot there that we, we don't yet understand. You know, we, we're just starting to kind of adopt these things that we, we don't yet understand. But I, what I heard in the discussion so far, I was trying to sort of take notes of areas of potential of, sh of such a shift of moving from expert systems to learning systems. And I, I, I wrote down three here, which I think is reiterate, reiterating what others have said. One has to do with this idea of what I would call flatness. So um, think about what is required to explore an unanticipated thread of thought in the design process when working with other paradigms, like traditional, traditional architectural methods, flat CAD, parametric modeling or scripting. When you think about like what happens when you change your mind when you're working through one of those things and all the things you have to kind of tear down and like build back up again, you know, the, the parametric model is useless. Once you change your mind about some fundamental principle, you've got to build it up again. Whereas working kind of with machine learning models, I think at least the, the promise of ML models is that um, because you're kind of operating in this sort of tacit way through a, a model of like design by example, where you just, need to show it other examples or kind of direct it in, in, in another way. It's more like growing a garden than kind of, kind of building a structure and that you can kind of have different forms of influence, which I think are, um, are, are, are really interesting and begin to address things that previous paradigms did not address well in the way that we tend to work as designers. Um, this is why I'm excited. Yeah, uh, actually Kyle, that brings us directly into the questions about the ethics of this whole endeavor. Uh, because what you were describing, of course, means that somebody has to build up a data set and somebody has to label that data set. And that's actually gonna allow us to interrogate the data set for specific machine learning processes. Now, who is doing the data set? What's the content of the data set? And that's a very important question. And I've noticed that um, also there's another problem we have in architects. There are no dedicated data sets for architecture yet. So we're working on it and so on. We're trying let's, to, to let's get- change that. Let's change that. Yeah, no, we're changing that. We're changing <laughs> yeah, that yeah. for sure. Yeah, we're working on that. Um, but it means really, for example, that if, if I take uh, my students from Taubman College and they alone label the data set that they're trying to make, which is going to be public for every architect in the world, then it's completely biased towards that audience that labeled that, yeah? So the question is here, how do we spread? How do we act? Yeah, in this in this kind of environment early on right now. Yeah, because if we don't do it now, it's going to be too late at some point. But we have the chance now to create a more diverse and inclusive data set design so that we can hopefully fairly say that there is that, that the bias is at least in check. It's, it's probably never possible to completely eradicate it. Yeah, but I, I don't know if eradication of the bias is the proper goal. So I, I think that that's if, if you're building an a, if you're building a you know a machine learning system intended to predict whether or not a prisoner if released a prisoner is if released 
or is going to commit another crime, that's something you want to eradicate bias from, right? There's, there is a, there is a, there, there is the ethical tangle of that problem. I think that should not be done first of all, but the, like that, th th that's a very different kind of problem. I think that the, rather for us, for creative practitioners, I don't think the aim is the eradication of bias. It's the, it, it, it's the recognition that data is a cultural artifact. It, it, it is, it's part of our work. It's not something which should be detached from the act of, of authorship. It's, it's, it's inherent. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I mean, actually, we have done also experiments in our, in our studio about using bias intentionally and with a specific purpose. Yeah, so I think I, I agree with that. Um, nonetheless, I think that there is, the, the, and also objectification is always a problem because somebody can say, well, they, I did it, it's objective, so that's why it's true and right, which in itself is already a problematic uh, way to see it. Um, yeah, but uh, the, the, the main thing here is that we as architects who are dealing with this, we, we should be aware about these problems and we also need to educate the next ones coming up. Immanuel said already how many students are interested already in, 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 in this field that they should know about these problems that come along with it or, or yeah. able, to, able to act on it, yeah. But I think we are already too late for, for the data question, we are already too late. But when you look at uh, real estate platforms, uh, they take the, the, just from the for uploaded photographs, uh, they rebuild the floor plans and interiors. When you have just with the Wi-Fi signal of a, of a phone, uh, you can uh, 3D build uh, already the, the whole interior and, and spatial map. When you look into a field of spatial computation, then actually the 3D interior, and then with their semantic, in a way, uh, clustering, uh, you know exactly where any plug and, and so on, how cables or like you get, uh, you get uh, already now, this is already, people have this already, uh, BIM models basically uh, from, from, uh, uh, from the entire kind of tile, like built, built environment in a way. Yeah, but then the question is who has access to this data? Who owns that data? This is, this is the big question, yeah. big problem at the moment. And I think here we, we have really to, to pledge forward because of course now it's like, and this is the whole uh, uh, problem with, with big data because it means uh, it needs someone big uh, with access or building this with in a way uh, the, the affordance in a way of, uh, of that amount of computation. Often way having a server farm, having a data server somewhere uh, to afford that in a way to harvest that and to, to store and to compute also over this. And, and I think, yeah, that's, uh, I think this is like, uh, gets very much like a role, I think, uh, for of course. Well, like, yeah, there we are directly into the discussion that, uh, of course, like the, the role of architects uh, is, is fundamentally ch changing. It's what new kind of problems and uh, actually new kind of spatial dimensions, so to say, uh, on the way opening up for this. That is such a good point. And I think it's a, it's a little, it feels a little tangent to the, 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 the question of creativity and machine learning and design, but I think it's hugely important. Um, the way I see it, so like the, the environmental data collection and, and the, the use of environmental data, who has authority over this? Who, who, who is it could be a curator and um, an advocate for, let's call them users, uh, occupants in this world? I think that, I, I doubt that. Just looking at the history of our discipline, um, we have not been very good about like, <laughs> about guarding the territory, the territorial claim of architecture has continually shrunk over the decades, right? Over the, over, 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 certainly over the centuries. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not very optimistic that we're going to do anything to claim, hang on to that particular territorial claim. But I think, and not that it's ours, it's kind of, it's kind of up for grabs. So imagine like, you know, the position of building operation manager, you know, like the, the dude who makes sure that the HVAC is on or whatever. Um, or and, and now like runs the building information model, like the live one, the digital twin. Imagine that, but for inclusive of data collection about the activity of users and privacy. Like that's, I think traditionally, if you look at the kind of skill set that we used to claim territory over as a discipline, that should be someone who understands very broadly the implications of activities, of use, 
of the built environment, the, the details of the built environment, that ought to be us, that ought to be architects. I, I think the world would be better if that was us. Not me, <laughs> I don't think I want to do it, <laughs> but, um, but I don't think that we'll get it. I, I, I don't think that we'll have it. But it, I think it also just speaks to how broad and like earth shaking this transformation is. But it so opens it up. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. sorry. So, Go ahead. so I'm just wondering, since we're talking about the ethics and biasness, so and and Kai mentioning about the the architect figure and his space of influence. So I'm I'm wondering, would then the this issue of ethics be the something that the architects could also be take you know taking more responsibility? After all, we are the one who's supposed to you know the, in the production. In, Kind of responsible for the production of culture. And as you said, we're supposed to be well informed about occupants' behavior and all that. So in, in a way, uh, perhaps that would be something that we, 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 we could contribute. And uh, before, maybe before uh, Matthias, uh, you're talking about the bias thing. And uh, as you mentioned, I think this idea of, it's quite a different discussion between the biasness in image net, for instance, of not including a huge diversity of object classes and the kind of bi biasness in, in creativity where at times it, it becomes opportunities to reflect on specific uh, um, um, ideas or specific context or, or situation in, in, in society. So I, I think we have to also think a bit more deeply about this very notion of bias without directly boring them. And the issue of er eradicating biasness is, I, I think is slightly utopian. <laughs> I mean, like it, it's, I had this conversation just yesterday uh, with someone. And on the one hand, he said that, um, he, he wants AI to be more humanized. And then at the same time, he said that, you know, there's this issue of biasness and whatsoever. But actually the, the biasness is a reflection of us. So you're in fact doing what you, you know, is actually, we, we already have that kind of humanized AI in that sense where it, it includes the implicit biasness, but this is exactly not what we want also. So it's, uh, yeah, quite interesting. Yeah, you know, from uh, my sorry. perspective. Just quickly, I, I, I do agree with Emmanuel, and I also have to say that I, I choose an unfortunate word to, to describe. <laughs> so this was my mistake. So I agree. I completely agree. So from my perspective, I think, uh, I mean, uh, it's not only that we, we have to, um, to do something about the data set. And by the way, Kyle, you have my vote in case that you, uh, you jump in and <laughs> to take lead there. Uh, but I, I don't think it's only about the data set. Um, like I was also mentioning before, right now, uh, whatever um, networks we work with, uh, they are not really fully representing the way that we learn. You know? And we all know that most of the networks that we work with, they are based on surveillance technology. As, at least that's how they started. And then we just continued in a way developing that kind of technology. Uh, but that's not, not the way that we learn. Yeah? So um, probably that, that has to be, yes, data set, then has to be also a matter of, uh, can we develop some models that are actually uh, uh, more suitable in a way to the way that uh, we learned design, perhaps, yeah, not necessarily just this kind of idea of collecting a lot of data. Um, the other aspect for me is like when it comes to collecting a lot of data, it's just, uh, I'm just uh, afraid of this kind of super like uh, uh, conservative in a way approach to things because uh, whatever we put in, whatever kind of uh, structure uh, it's representing that data set, that's what the network is going to generate, yeah. If you think about if there is a very prevalent uh, structure in the history, then the network is going to just output that prevalent uh, uh, structure. Yeah? If you talk about bias, like a female male, for example, if the history that you are presenting to the network is very, in a way, uh, has a lot of examples of this kind of structure, then of course the network is going to output that structure. It's not necessarily the network is biased, it's the data that we input and the kind of algorithm, learning algorithm that we use, it's actually not properly proper. Yeah. And I think we also uh, have to think of, of the other aspect of, um, um, personally, I, I am not a very big fan of uh, AI as a big machine AI that learns everything. Yeah. I am a big fan of uh, like this kind of very localized in a way AI, because I think what makes uh, humans and designers very interesting is the fact that 
each one of us, we have a sort of proximity when it comes to culture. Uh, so uh, I was born in a certain location. I have proximity to, to a certain culture. I was influenced by certain things. And maybe that makes uh, certain, uh, certain interpretations and certain aesthetics and results that I output interesting yeah, or uh, worth considering. Uh, but if we have just one AI that learns everything from uh, all over, it's, then it's quite boring in my opinion. It's, uh, we are just uh, conserving uh, everything that was done. Yeah? So this, this is the, the other uh, aspect. And I think another point that I wanted to mention is also this aspect of um, uh, AI. It's uh, an extremely brutal machine in terms of optimization. So AI is just brutal optimization. And I think uh, there you also have to start to think about certain aspects of yeah, you are aiming, let's say, for quality of life, or you can, in a way, improve the quality of life by uh, excluding people, like by eliminating people, or you can optimize in a different way. Yeah? So an AI is just going to optimize something, it doesn't have compassion or something. Yeah? So I think that that's another level yeah, that, that probably uh, has to be taken into consideration. We, we as designers, we have to find, and yeah, this is another point, sorry that I wanted to mention about data set, yeah? So personally, I'm always thinking about, can I develop a sort of uh, AI human interaction that will allow in a way um, for the human to, uh, to insert a completely new, let's say, trend or something, yeah? Because if I just let the machine, how will the ma machine understand where, when we have a, a shift now? Yeah, like uh, I think at one point in uh, one of our discussions, Sandra was mentioning this kind of idea of, you know, if you just fit in like these kind of floor plans from history, well, those floor plans from history, they represent a sort of way of living, yeah? But where, where was the shift, yeah? Into a different kind of floor plan, a different kind of way of li living. And then for me, it will be, okay, uh, if you have an AI that learns, do you allow in a way for doors or this kind of back doors in a way to allow to bring in now completely new, uh, uh, ideas, uh, different, different uh, ways that we, as society, we decide to go for. I, I have a question. I mean, we are we are slowly, slowly coming towards the end, but I, I would have a larger question for the for the entire group, uh, based a little bit maybe on what Daniel was just saying about uh, optimization and how AIs basically are geared towards uh, towards uh, that goal. Um, they are they are designed like that. They're basically a curve fitting algorithm that actually tries to to adapt to a specific condition that you define as the user, and and it's going to try to do it as good as possible. Or there is the option that you, as the user, intentionally try to shy away from that curve by giving him, for example, bad weights, and thus forcing the algorithm to generate something that is strange, weird, new, different, and so on. Which is the interesting part of it, but. It's also a bit of paradoxical right, at the end. So, I mean, at the end, the building a building is not really rocket science. So how, how much uh, perception is actually, is there a point when it's enough? Is there, like, is there a point where we in architecture uh, like uh, have, a, have too much affordance, but, which would be not let's say necessary or like, uh, be being be having the capacity to be absorbed in a way, like another the opposite of of a fondness. So, because like also the paradox on this that uh, we're in the middle of a housing crisis, or not in the middle, or like uh, I mean like everywhere, buildings getting more and more boring, but at the same time more and more expensive. So we, we, in a way, we, we open up more and more capacities in our discipline to have more and more richer, complex forms or, or not ways how to construct to make it cheaper, actually, or theoretically, we can all do that. And, but actually, in reality, it's, it's not happening. Or it's, it goes completely in a, in a very paradoxical other, other way. And yeah like he, here i'm wondering just like uh this this kind of rift in a way like yeah like daniel you're opening up a totally new discussion <laughs> 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 at the end of our <laughs> of our of the one hour discussion so. i didn't want to explore it <laughs> it's another can of worms yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> but a good one. For, me yeah, wrong. for this, I would I would maybe reframe zoom zooming out a bit, and perhaps it's not enough to talk about AI and architecture, but AI and design more broadly. If we want to think about the way in which this this technology or these methods might set us in relationship to people who use the things that we make in a different way or invite the people who use the things that we make into the process of design in a, in a different way in the tradition of participatory design or something like this. And I think for that, I mean, this is going again back to a discussion we had last time about how, how this paradigm shift uh, insists that we look to another sort of constellation of outside influences and expertise and knowledge in order to influence it. But, you know, there's people who work in the manufacturing and branding product design kind of space that are thinking about radically different relationships between the process of design, manufacturing, um, uh, delivery of, of, of products, and the, the ways in which uh, you know, people kind of participate in that pro in, in, in that in that process um, to make things more I don't know equitable, responsive. I, su I suppose in, in that world they're very much caught in a I would say caught in a in a a way a frame of thinking that has to do with like responsiveness to the needs of a of a of a consumer or a client, which I think has certain positive aspects that we could learn from as to, as architects. It also holds some negative negative downsides, uh, lim some limitations. But thinking about like housing as a product that is in crisis, hopefully we're in the middle of the crisis. That would be good to know that we were halfway done with it. Um, and how how this maybe opens up you know ways of thinking about solutions. I would look to that space. I would look to product design and manufacturing. Great. Uh, so thank you very much. I think we, we can slowly wrap up this conversation. This was super informative. It was great comments. Um, I'm looking forward to the, continue our conversation. Uh, this series will continue with lectures of each one of the individual participants throughout the next couple of months. Uh, look out for new content coming up. And um, yeah, with this being said, uh, thank you everyone for the participation. Uh, it was a great conversation and I hope we can continue this very soon.